All right, good morning, everybody. It seems like most of the uh, traffic has ceased from uh, the refectory, so I think uh, since we have a long day ahead of us, we may as well go ahead and uh, get started. My name is uh, Christopher Carstens. I'm the director of the Office of Sacred Worship. Uh, for the next few sessions, at least in this room, we're going to turn our attention and focus a little more uh, acutely on uh, this year of faith that we're beginning to hear more and more about. Uh, this year of faith, as you, uh, as you know, is to coincide with the opening of the Second Vatican Council uh, on October 11, 1962, uh, and also the 20th anniversary from the promulgation of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which uh, John Paul II called the Catechism the last document of the Second Vatican Council. Kind of a nice way to think about it. It really is the fruit of all of the, all of the teachings that the Council has given us. But in any case, we want to turn today, and this is something that we should be doing throughout the year of faith, turn and actually look at what the Second Vatican Council actually taught and said. The teachings and the texts of the Council are meant to be, and this is an expression of Blessed John Paul II, a sure compass as we embark upon the third Christian millennium. Well, in order for a compass to work, you have to know how to read it. You have to know what it says. And this is what we want to do uh, in this first session. All right, so this uh, session will be divided up into three parts. Uh, the first is, we want to look at, well, where did the Second Vatican Council come from? It didn't just drop out of the sky one day. It had some context. It had some roots. And so we want to look at uh, uh, its origin. Second of all, we want to look, even if briefly, at what the Second, Second Vatican Council actually said. I mean, ask yourself this question. When was the last time you read any document of the Second Vatican Council? I mean, I ask myself this. I mean, I've read parts of some, but there's others to this day I've never read. And if it's to be my sure compass to lead me and to help me to lead others, I ought to be a little bit more familiar, familiar with it. So we'll look briefly at some of the things that the Council gave to us. And then lastly, I want to see how it's been interpreted over the last 50 years. Basically, we're looking at before, during, and after the Council. When we come back after lunch, we're going to look at uh, how we are to use the, the, the Council teachings today and into the future. Okay, but these are our three breakdowns of this first section. So let's go to the first one. Where did the Second Vatican, Vatican Council come from? And I want to parse this out into, again, three categories. We're going to look at the changes that the Church underwent over, the, over the, her life in the 20th century before the Council. Secondly, we want to see what was going on in the world and all of the various changes that happened uh, uh, secularly in the world in the 20th century. And then thirdly, how these two, the Church and the world, came to relate to each other. Because all of this is necessary to understand why the Council Fathers said the things that they did. Okay. Let's go first. You know, the fact that there's a, a Second Vatican Council might lead some to uh, think that once upon a time there must have been a First Vatican Council. And sure enough, there was. The First Vatican Council was from December 8, uh, 1869 to July 20th, 1870 ish. We're not one, much one for facts in the Office of Sacred Worship, but we'll, we'll explain that ish in a little bit. So, a really, a rather short council, eight months. Uh, the Second Vatican Council was, what, three, maybe four years. The council uh, immediately before the First Vatican Council was the Council of Trent, and that lasted 18 years. Okay, so it gives you some idea. This is a rather brief uh, council. And uh, the fruits of the council were two. There was one called uh, Dei Fidelis, Fides? Uh, on, the, on the Faith, on the Faith. That was the one, the one teaching, and the other one was called Pastor Eternus, and this was a dogmatic constitution on the church. Now, this is noteworthy because, fast forward 100 years, there was in the Second Vatican Council a dogmatic constitution on the church. And this is, this is an important point because this uh, uh, constitution on the church from the First Vatican Council never really finished. It was, the council was uh, uh, stopped abruptly. This constitution in the First Vatican Council was meant to be 15 chapters long, and they only got to the first four, and these first four were on papal infallibility. Papal infallibility. All right. Um, beginning, though, this, this is the takeaway point here, beginning with the First Vatican Council, we see that the Church really trying to focus attention on herself, okay? trying to come to a clear identity of who she is, and a clear way to express who she is to the rest of the world. 
Uh, once in my studies, a, uh, a teacher uh, told me this, and it stuck with me all this time, and it, I found it very helpful. Uh, for the first Christian millennium, the first thousand years, the, uh, the questions were about Jesus and God and the Trinity. Is Jesus God? Is he man? Is he both? Is he neither? Where does he come from? What about the Holy Spirit? Is the Holy Spirit God? Does he come from the Father? Does he come from the Son? Does he come through from both? For the second thousand years of Christianity, the questions were about the sacraments. How many sacraments are there? Are there eleven? Are there seven? What's a major sacrament? A minor sacrament? Do they have to be found in the sacred scriptures for them to be a sacrament? The third Christian millennium, which we're a part in now, is questions about the church. What is the church? How does the visible church relate to the invisible church? Is there salvation outside of the church? How are non-Christians related to the church? So this is uh, where we find ourselves now. This started with the First Vatican Council. One of the bishops who was uh, a member of the First Vatican Council put it this way. Jesus Christ has three exis ex existences. It's a little bit early still, I guess. Uh, his personal existence, which Arius denied, is the first thousand years. His sacramental existence, which Calvin and others denied, that's the second thousand years. And now that other existence which completes the two, and by means of which he continually lives through his authority in the person of his vicar. The Council of the Vatican, in proclaiming this third existence, has completed the task of assuring the world of the possession of Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ in the church is really the topic of today, and what the church is trying to express more clearly. Uh, kind of a midway point between the First Vatican Council and us today is uh, Pius XII in this letter that he wrote on the mystical body of Christ, on the church. So we see the church coming to articulate more and more clearly. He says this, Christ makes use of the church that his work begun might endure. This, incidentally, is a quote from the First Vatican Council. Okay? So it would be a two tier to understand what the Second Vatican Council says. You have to know what the First Vatican Council has said. He continues, if we would define and describe this true church of Jesus Christ, which is the one holy Catholic and apostolic Roman church, that too is a quote from the First Vatican Council, its constitution on the Christian faith, we shall find nothing more noble, more sublime, more divine than the expression of the mystical body of Christ, an expression which springs from and is, as it were, the fair flowering of the repeated teaching of the sacred scriptures and the holy fathers. So this flowering, this, this new kind of expression of how to understand the church. You know, maybe... I don't know, I'm guessing, of course. A hundred years ago, if you had to map out the church on a diagram, the church on a chalkboard for those in your CCD class, how would you do it? Probably a big triangle. You have the Pope here, and the bishops, and the clergy, and the people at the bottom. Okay? That's still true, but it's expressed a little differently now. The most common notion of expressing the church now is the mystical body of Christ, a very living, inanimate thing. Okay, let's go to our second category. The church is coming to a clear identification of herself. The world, too, is undergoing many changes uh, over the years. This is Pius IX, who was the Pope during the First Vatican Council. And uh, so he was the one who proclaimed this uh, uh, papal infallibility on, uh, in uh, Pastor Eternus. And this was not a universally popular uh, teaching. Okay? The uh, breakdown of the voting uh, for that was about 533-4. <laughs> Two against, one of those was an American bishop, by the way. But then there were 55 bishops who just skipped town. They didn't want to be there to vote for it, and they didn't want to go down in history as voting against it. Okay? So it was not a universally accepted thing. Uh, in fact, when he uh, proclaims uh, Pastor Eternus on July 18th, he says there was a huge thunderstorm that was rolling through uh, uh, Rome, and he's proclaiming this amidst lightning and thunder. Okay? Well, in the world, too, things were going to get a little raucous, because in 19, or excuse me, on July 19, the day after, there's the outbreak of the Franco-Prussian War. Now, this fellow, Napoleon III, was his troops who were guarding the Papal States, or at this time, it's really about the city of Rome, okay? When war is declared uh, with Prussia, uh, Napoleon III takes all of his troops back to fight in this war, and Victor Emmanuel sw swoops in and takes the rest of the city, leaving basically what we have now, simply uh, the Vatican itself. Okay? Uh, so he was, of course, excommunicated. I think he'd been excommunicated about 10 years before, but he was really excommunicated now. <laughs> and this was just a sign of things to come, right? The bloodiest uh, uh, century on record, beginning with that war to end all wars, and followed by the next world war. 
war, uh, very shortly after. This is after a, a bombing raid by Allied planes in the city of Rome, and Pius XII goes out to support those uh, following the air raid. Okay, so the world itself, great upheavals, great changes uh, in its own life over the 20th century. Now, our third thing then, leading up to the Council, is how is the Church and the world, how have they been relating to each other prior to the Council? Because their way of thinking became more and more at odds, more and more divergent. The world uh, entered into a period of what's called modernism, which sees in the present age the furthest progress of man and rejects traditional institutions, such as culture, in culture, in religion, and thought, which check natural progress. So modernism holds that we can do it on our own. It's up to our own work and our own efforts. And what we need to do to keep moving forward is get rid of these shackles that are holding us back. Okay? Now, if you belong to a church that has very uh, clear ties to tradition and roots, that is very inconsistent. Okay? They want to cut those roots. All right? So a different way of thinking. Also, naturalism, uh, which sees uh, and wills to see in the church nothing but a juridical and social union. In other words, the church is a corporation, a body, just like any other. IBM, or the Moose Lodge, or the Boy Scouts, or whatever it might be. You remember, not personally, of course, but you remember uh, this fellow, uh, Nestorius, way back in the 5th century, who championed the humanity of Jesus Christ so much that his divinity came into question. Right? This is basically a modern-day Nestorianism on the level of the church. It's just another human institution. There's nothing divine about it. Or again, rationalism, which ridicules anything that transcends and defies the power of human genius. Okay? If it can't be proved by science and technology, it ain't true. And as some have suggested, even you know, the scientist is the, the priest of our day. He has his own vesture and his own vessels and his own sanctuary and everything like that. That is the person to whom we look to find true answers. Basically, there's an ism for anything you'd ever want. Okay. Uh, pantheism, gods and everything. Nihilism, there's nothing. What you see is what you get. Atheism, there's no God. Communism, state-sponsored atheism. Materialism, there's nothing spiritual at all. Or variations of relativism, individualism, subjectivism. I am the judge. There's no objective truth. Okay? So it's these three things, the life of the church that's been changing, or at least the expression of herself that's been changing, the world, which has gone undergone great upheavals uh, over the 20th century, and then their relationship. All of this uh, is the context and the life in which we can understand what the Council Fathers had to say. So let's turn now briefly to, well, what did the Second Vatican Council say? Uh, this is a blessed John the uh, 23rd, okay? He was, uh, see, Pius XII died after almost a 20-year papacy on October 9th. And uh, John XXIII was elected very shortly thereafter. He was 77 years old, and, uh, you know, by, uh, by all of he was called the Jolly Pope, right? I mean, you could put a beard on him, and he looked like Santa Claus almost. Right? He's, he's a giornamento in person, this breath of fresh air. Okay? Um, I wish I knew more of the substance of his teachings. Unfortunately, all I can remember is that one uh, uh, anecdote about the visitor to the Vatican, and they asked uh, John the 23rd, they said, Holy Father, how many people work here in the Vatican? And he said, I'd say about half of them. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that gives you some indication of, you know, just what a happy, uh, 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 joyful man that, uh, that he was. Okay, so John the 23rd is elected on October 28, 1958. On January 25, 1959. My math is right, that's less than Three months after being elected Pope, he announces his intentions to call the Vatican Council. Okay? Now, the, the, the story is, is that he's 77 years old, right? He's not going to do anything crazy. He's not going to be Pope for 20 years like a Pius XII. Well, he apparently did not get that memo. Okay? So he calls the Second Vatican Council. When he opens the council, he even speaks of it in these terms. He says, it came upon me like a flash of heavenly light. It was sudden. It was completely unexpected. Those were his own words about the calling of this council. So we want to look to him to see, well, what was the whole purpose of this? He's the one who called it, after all. What did he say about his intentions, about the purpose of the council? This is his address at the opening of the council on October 11th, uh, 1962. He says, The greatest concern of the ecumenical council is this that the sacred deposit of Christian doctrine should be guarded, number one, 
And number two, taught more efficaciously. So please take away these two points. He has two principal purposes in mind. To take, to guard, the word he uses is guarded, that the positive faith is meant to be carried over whole and entire on the one hand. But on the other, it's meant to be taught in a way that is more efficacious for the men and women of today. He elaborates on this. So this is the first point. It is necessary, uh, it is necessary first of all, that the church should never depart from the sacred patrimony of the truth received from the fathers. That is, the 21st Ecumenical Council, and by the fact that he names it the 21st Ecumenical Council, he sees this in a long line, a string of all of the Ecumenical Councils that it is consistent with. This 21st Ecumenical Council wishes to transmit the doctrine, pure and integral, without any attenuation or distortion. All right? The same deposit of faith coming forward. But, at the same time, she must ever, she must ever look to the present, to the new conditions and the new forms of life introduced into the modern world. We've just seen, even briefly, all the upheavals that have gone on during the 20th century. We need to present it in a new way. The substance of the ancient doctrine of the deposit of faith is one thing, and the way in which it is presented is another, and it is the latter that must be taken into great consideration. All right? So on one hand, the deposit of faith, on the other hand, presented in a fresh and new way. Now, when the council itself began, or rather the, the, the first document that it released is the, the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy and the Latin title is uh, Sacrosanctum Concilium. So they name all these uh, uh, Latin uh, documents by the first letters uh, of the document. Sacrosanctum Concilium really has nothing to do with the liturgy. It's this first paragraph that means this sacred council. Okay? So when that first paragraph, the very first document, it begins, this sacred council has four aims in view. What are they? First, it desires to impart an ever-increasing vigor to the Christian life of the faithful, which would make us think, now I haven't been around that long, that maybe Christian life wasn't as vigorous as it needed to be. If the first stated goal of this council is to put a little fire uh, under us, okay, that's the first, to invigorate Christian life. Secondly, to adapt more suitably to the needs of our own times those institutions which are subject to change. Okay, this is a, just a flowering of what John XXIII himself said, okay, adapting where, where we can. Third, to foster whatever can promote union among all who believe in Christ. So all of the baptized, uh, non-Catholic non Christians, to unite us all in that one church of Christ. And then lastly, to strengthen whatever can help call the whole of mankind into the household of the church. You know, ec ecclesial, or ecclesia, means literally to call out. Ec is like exit, or out. Kalein means to call out. Okay? So what can the church do to strengthen her call to all men and women to come into the church? Well, the council gave 16 documents. Four of these are called constitutions. These are the most important. And just very briefly, I'd like to just take a highlight, a highlight a couple of things from each of these. Okay? This is our task, again, for the year of faith to become more familiar with what the Second Vatican Council has given us. So these four constitutions are the Constitution on the Liturgy, the Dogmatic Constitution on the Church, harking back to the First Vatican Council. Third, the Constitution on Divine Revelation, and then lastly, the Pastoral Constitution on the Church in the Modern World. So let's just look at each of these four briefly and see what some of the most uh, important parts are. The first, on the Sacred Liturgy, and now this was the first of the 16 documents to be released to us, and in large part because it had been about 60 years in the making. There had been a, a liturgical movement that preceded the Second Vatican Council. So it's as if the, the preparatory commission for this constitution had been gone all the way back to Pius X in 1903. So they were ready to discuss this. This is one of the things that the Council Fathers said on the liturgy. Pastors of souls must therefore realize that when the liturgy is celebrated, something more is required than the mere observation of the laws governing valid and licit celebration. So notice these two principles operative here from uh, John the 23rd. Okay, it's not saying, oh, these laws that are governing valid and licit celebration aren't important anymore. No, no, we're bringing all of that forward, but we're adding to it. So he continues, or like the Constitution continues. It is their duty also to ensure that the faithful take part fully aware of what they are doing, actively engaged in the rite and enriched by its effects. Know what you are doing when you go to Mass. 
You know, when a priest is ordained, the bishop takes the, the chalice and he takes the pat and he puts them into the hands of the newly ordained and he says, know what you are doing. Know what you celebrate. We too are priests. We participate in the priesthood of Jesus Christ through our baptisms. And it's up to us to know what we are doing too. It's not just enough to follow the rubrics anymore, although that's important. Another thing the, uh, sacred, the Constitution says is in the restoration and promotion of the sacred liturgy, this full and active participation by all the people is the aim to be considered above all else, the most important thing. For it is the primary and indispensable source from which the faithful are to drive the true Christian spirit. Therefore, pastors of souls must zealously strive to achieve it by means of the necessary instruction in all their pastoral work. So what's the one thing more important than any others in the reform and restoration of the liturgy? Active participation. And that doesn't mean that we can be electors now. What it means is to truly participate in the sacrifice of the Mass, the heart of which is Jesus Christ saying yes to God the Father and the Holy Spirit. That's true active participation. Uh, at a breakout session yesterday, we discussed this a little bit. The first pope to coin this term, active participation, was Pius X, 1903. Pius X, this gives you some indication of what he means by it. Uh, he is the patron saint of first communicants. That's what he meant by active participation, worthy participation in the sacrifice of the Mass. Okay, let's go on next to the Church. Now, as I said before, the First Vatican Council started this. This is like part two, since it never got finished before. Uh, on the Church, and you, again, it says, it says a lot of things. I've just picked out a few of the principles that uh, I think would be worthy of discussion today. The society structured with hierarchical organs and the mystical body of Christ are not to be considered as two realities. Ever heard this before? There's some visible church that so-and-so could be a part of, but the, the visible Roman Catholic church is really irrelevant to the whole discussion. Nor are the visible assembly and spiritual community to be considered as two realities. Nor the earthly church and the church enriched with heavenly things to be considered as two realities. Rather, they form one complex reality which coalesces from a divine and human element. For this reason, by no weak analogy, it is compared to the mystery of the incarnate word. In other words, saying the visible Roman Catholic Church isn't important is about like saying, well, the incarnate word really is important. You know, I believe in the second person of the Trinity, but that whole incarnation part, well, I can kind of take or leave that. That's the analogy that's going on here. Okay, there's one church with two elements. Yeah, there's no division between those, even though there are distinctions. Okay? And this is the church trying to come to a clear expression of her own identity. Next, another thing that the, the Constitution says, the faithful are by baptism made one body with Christ and are constituted among the people of God. They are in their own way made shares in the priestly, prophetic, and kingly functions of Christ. That's what I just said. We're, we are all priests, prophets, and kings in light of our baptism. Of course, that post-baptismal anointing, you know, they give to an infant, you know, consecrates them, the text says, as priests, prophets, and kings. And they are to carry, they are to carry out for their own part the mission of the world, of the whole Christian people in the church and in the world. So every baptized person has the job to transform the world by going out being a priest, prophet, and king. That's how we actively participate in the church. Okay? This doesn't mean that now Chris Karstens can work for the Diocese of La Crosse. Nah, no, that's not what it means at all. It means that uh, lay persons uh, are to be holy parents and truck drivers and politicians and all of the rest okay, out in their daily activities. Okay, the third uh, constitution from Vatican II is uh, on divine revelation. It says this, among other things, the obedience of faith is to be given to God who reveals an obedience by which man commits his whole self freely to God, offering the full submission of intellect and will to God who reveals. That's a quote from the First Vatican Council. Uh, and freely assenting to the truth revealed by him. Okay, so obedience means to listen to, but it's not just a, a, a listening with our ears or with our mind or something like that. It is our whole body, just like the Blessed Mother here, who's the who's the model of obedience and faith. Okay, she gives her intellect, she gives her will, and quite literally, she gives her whole body over to God, okay? incarnating the word in her own self. That's what we are to do. You know, the caricature, true or false, before the council was, well, Catholics have the sacraments, Protestants have the Bible. Okay? Uh, well, Catholics uh, uh, 
have a great interest in the sacred scriptures uh, as well. At least we need to have a great interest. Uh, the church has always venerated the divine scriptures, just as she venerates the body of the Lord. Since especially in the sacred liturgy, she unceasingly receives and offers to the faithful the bread of life from the table, both of God's word and of Christ's body. And so in the Second Vatican Council, in a number of documents, there's this talk about the table of the word, that we are nourished on substantial food of the word of God. These words have meat. They have substance. Uh, Gregory the Great says that these divine words grow together with the one who reads them. When we read the scriptures, they're so substantial, they change us just like the food we eat. It changes us. You know, there's that image uh, also in the book of Revelation where the angel hands the scroll to John and he eats it. Now, this is what we do. We're, we're, there's, there's real substance in the words. In fact, you notice uh, after the uh, proclamation of the gospel, what happened this morning at Mass? The deacon takes the book of the Gospels back to the bishop, and he gives us the benediction. Okay? Almost like you would do with the monstrance and the blessed sacrament. Okay? Because both of these things, in a certain sense, contain the substance, the logos, Jesus himself. Okay, so the church is directing us uh, to the scriptures. Now, the final constitution that uh, the church gives us is uh, uh, Gaudium et Spes, which means joy and hope. And we heard this word joy yesterday from Father Czech. Okay. Uh, now, we've already had one constitution on the church. Why do we need another one? Well, that first one, Lumen Gentium, is really kind of the church in herself. This one, Gaudium et Spes, is the church going out of herself and how she uh, acts and reacts with the modern world. Uh, this... Uh, uh, Paragraph here, number 22, is also that same uh, excerpt that Father Czech uh, drew our attention to yesterday. The truth is that only in the mystery of the incarnate word does the mystery of man take on life. Bishop Callahan said this very th same thing in his homily this morning as well. Christ, the final Adam, by the revelation of the mystery of the Father and his love, fully reveals man to man himself and makes his supreme calling clear. So Jesus comes not only to reveal God to us, but almost more fundamentally, who we are ourselves. Okay? He teaches us that uh, uh, new life is a gift of God, and that's joy in the womb. Okay? What it's like to live in a holy family and be obedient to parents and to raise a holy child. What a life of suffering and sacrifice uh, and service entails. Tells us where our destiny is. He reveals to us our humanity, not just our divinity. I've chosen as an example here uh, a very joyful young lady, uh, Blessed Chiara Luce Bodama, who I do not know much about. Uh, and if you don't know much about her, I'd encourage you to, uh, to look her up. Uh, she uh, died in 1990 at the age of 19. She suffered from and uh, was a victim of some form of cancer. And uh, there's these sad but beautiful pictures of her, even, you know, as she like, uh, lays dying, and she's lost all of her hair. She still has the smile, though. Her friends would come and uh, console her, but they would be consoled by her. Her parents, who are probably still alive as far as I know, would come to console her and receive consolation from her. She would go around on the entire ward, serving those who were dying. She would sacrifice, it said, her morphine and her other painkillers so that she could die in union with Jesus Christ. Jesus has taught her how to be human, and she was, and she was. Uh, this is kind of a battle between the joyful people here. This is uh, Blessed Pierre Giorgio Frassati. Uh, now, Jim mentioned this to us in his uh, talk uh, yesterday as well. This is another quote from Gaudi, he says, This split between the faith which many profess in their daily lives deserves to be counted among the more serious errors of our age. <coughs> Therefore, let there be no false opposition between professional and social activities on the one part and religious life on the other. <laughs> Think of the uh, uh, freedom of religion that we're, the debate we're in now. Okay? It's not freedom of worship where you spend your hour on Sunday morning and then it stops at the church door and then you get on with your real life out there in the world. No, that is one of the most serious errors of our age, they're saying, 50 years ago. Okay? All of life is to be penetrated by, uh, by our life of faith. Uh, this example, Blessed Pierre Giorgio Frassati, uh, was, was, that, was that very man, a man of the Beatitudes, as uh, John Paul II calls him. 
him and his great uh, uh, pictures of him you can find on the internet. He was an outdoorsman, a hiker. Uh, the pictures are true. You know, liked to party, liked to have fun. Was uh, politically active. Gave away that he would leave for work in the morning. A change in his pocket, clothes on his back, and he would come back broke and half naked. <laughs> you know, because he, he's giving away his clothes. He's giving away his possessions. Uh, when he died, his family was amazed at all the people that came, because they didn't think he knew anybody. People who came to his funeral, the whole town showed up. They all knew him. Okay? He was truly living, truly existing. And in fact, here's this, uh, this uh, quite excellent quote. To live without faith, without a patrimony to defend, without a steady struggle for truth, that's not living. That's merely existing. That he embodies the Second Vatican Council. Okay? To invigorate Christian life, that's it precisely. Okay, so these then are at least some of the things, some of the many things that the, the, the Second Vatican Council has given to us. A couple from each of the constitutions. Pretty good stuff, huh? That's why the last 50 years have been nothing but rosy in the church. In the world. <laughs> this is how uh, one prominent uh, theologian and uh, ecclesiastic describes it. This is Pope Benedict. Uh, no one can deny that in vast areas of the church, the implementation of the council has been somewhat difficult. <laughs> but then, you know, after uh, discussing uh, homosexuality and contraception, you know, we could move on to something that's a little bit more uh, uncontroversial, the Second Vatican Council. <laughs> uh, uh, it's been somewhat difficult. Even without wishing to apply to what occurred in these years, the description that St. Basil made of the church's situation after the Council of Nicaea. Not wanting to apply that, but I'm going to go ahead and mention it anyway. St. Basil compares her situation to a naval battle in the darkness of the storm, saying, among other things, the raucous shouting of those who through disagreement rise up against one another, the incomprehensible chatter, the confused din of uninterrupted clamoring, has now filled almost the whole church, falsifying to excess or failure the right doctrine of the faith. Okay. Who's to blame? The Greek god Hermes, of course. <laughs> no, this, uh, this Hermes is the Greek god of communication, of speech. He's the messenger of the gods, and he has given to us this world, that, uh, the, given to the church and the world, uh, a word that is uh, kind of in vogue now, called hermeneutics, and it means interpretation. Pope Benedict uses it here. He says, why? Why is this the case? Why has the implementation of the council in large parts of the church thus far been so difficult? Well, it all depends on the correct interpretation of the council, or, as we would say today, on its proper hermeneutics, the correct key to its interpretation and application. The problems in its implementation arose from the fact that two contrary hermeneutics came face to face and quarreled with one another. One caused confusion, the other silently but more visibly bore and is bearing fruit. So we have two interpretations of the council that have been uh, at odds with one another. Again, this is difficult if you're trying to take your barriers and to use your compass. Okay? You can't have can't have the magnetic north be moving around on you. Where will you go? You'll be like that, uh, that, that ark, that ship uh, after Nicaea, lost, going this way and that. Here's how he describes the first one, this hermeneutic of discontinuity and disruption. He says, this hermeneutic, the hermeneutic of discontinuity, risks ending in a split between the preconciliar church and the postconciliar church. It asserts that the texts of the council, as such, do not yet express the true spirit of the Council. It claims that they are the result of compromises which, to reach unanimity, it was found necessary to keep and reconfirm many old things that are now pointless. The true spirit of the Council is not to be found in these compromises, but instead in the impulses toward the new that are contained in the text. This is how Pope Benedict describes this hermeneutic of discontinuity and disruption. Maybe the most uh, popular, famous example is Humanae Vitae in 1968. Okay? Is the church finally going to abandon her teaching prior to the council and move on, in light of the spirit of the council, to a new teaching on uh, human sexuality? Okay? No. Or, perhaps in a different sense, uh, I heard a lot of this uh, the last few years, 
simply the translation of the, of the Roman Missal. Many people who do not like it don't like it because it sounds too traditional, too old-fashioned, too consubstantial, and the rest. We need to cut that and move forward, concentrating on what we are doing today. Okay? That's the hermeneutic of discontinuity. On the other hand, there is the hermeneutic of reform. Here I shall cite only John the 23rd's well-known words, which unequivocally express this hermeneutic when he says that the council wishes, quote, to transmit the doctrine pure and integral without any attenuation or distortion. We've read this already. This is what John the 23rd says at the very beginning of the council. It is not to leave behind the deposit of faith, but to move it forward. And he continues, our duty is not only to guard this precious treasure as if, it were, as if we were concerned only with antiquity, but to dedicate ourselves with an earnest will and without fear to that work which our era demands of us. All right, so Pope Benedict, 50 years later, is saying precisely what John XXIII said on the front end of the council. Take the deposit, express it, teach it, proclaim it in a way that the men and women of this modern or postmodern world can incorporate and uh, come to that full stature of Jesus Christ. He continues, uh, wherever this interpretation uh, guided the implementation of the council, new life developed and new fruit ripened. Forty years after the council, so this is in 2005, we can show that the positive is greater and livelier, vigorous, livelier than it appeared to be in the turbulent years around 1968. I was not born in 1968, and so I thought, well, what happened in 1968? Because he mentions this date quite often. So I did uh, my Wikipedia research, and among other things happening in 1968, the Vietnam War in its height, uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated in 1968, Robert Kennedy was assassinated in 1968, Democratic National Convention uh, in Chicago was 1968. Uh, I was discussing this with Chris Ruff, and he said, well, that's true on the American side, and the European side, it was, uh, it was all that and then some. Okay? Turbulent is the right uh, uh, way to say it. Today we see that although the good seed develops slowly, it is nonetheless growing, and our deep gratitude for the work done by the Council is likewise growing. Okay? And this year of faith is meant to be that ripened fruit, to look back at the right hermeneutic to what the Council gave us, and to have this, uh, its text and its teaching bear fruit in our lives and those who teach. All right, we're about to wrap up now. This first session is called Second Vatican Council, that sure compass, which is this line from uh, Blessed John Paul II. He says this, this is right at the third millennium. He says, with the passing of the years, the council documents have lost nothing of their value or brilliance. They need to be read correctly. In other words, they need to be read with the proper hermeneutic. And part of that hermeneutic is knowing where they came from, knowing what they actually said. You know, we hear this uh, spirit of the council, uh, and that can be true, but for more and more of us, we, we're not familiar with the spirit of the council. The only access we have to the council is what it said. We don't remember what was happening in 1962 or 63 or 64. That's our only access. So these texts need to be read correctly, to be widely known and taken to heart as important and normative texts of the magisterium within the church's tradition. Now that the Jubilee has ended, 2000, I feel more than ever in duty bound to point to the Council as the great grace bestowed on the Church in the 20th century. There we find a sure compass by which to take our bearings in the century now beginning. Okay, this is our compass. Or I suppose it would be really good the time to say our GPS or something like that. These Council texts need to be known by us and lived accordingly. If we don't know what they say, that's difficult to do. And so he asks us, this is again is at the beginning of the new millennium, to make what he calls an examination of conscience. And he used this term uh, uh, in a number of instances uh, at, the, at the new millennium. But he says, examine your conscience in light of what the Second Vatican Council taught. Okay? And so just as we kind of go through these, ask yourself these things. You personally, your parish, our diocese, how well are we doing? How would you examine our diocesan conscience? conscience uh, in light of the council teachings. It says, this examination of conscience must also consider the reception given to the council, that great gift of the spirit to the church at the end of the second millennium. So he asks us four questions based upon the four constitutions. The first, 
To what extent has the Word of God become more fully the soul of theology and the inspiration of the whole of Christian living as Dave Irwin saw it? So I say ask yourself. What I mean by that more than anything is, Chris Carson, you ask yourself this. Okay? Uh, is the inspired Word of God the inspiration for my daily living? Or if I open my Bible with a spine crack and creak a little bit. Okay? So I ask myself that. Is the liturgy lived as the origin and summit of ecclesial life in accordance with the teaching of Sacrosanctum Concilium? Is the Sunday Mass the most important hour of your entire week? Is it the inspiration and the foundation for everything you do for the six days that follow? And is it the consummation of everything you have done throughout the week? I ask myself this. I ask you to ask this. Has, is this the case in your parish? Thirdly, in the universal church, and in the particular churches, the dioceses, is the ecclesiology of communion described in Lumen Gentium being strengthened? Does it leave room for charisms, ministries, and different forms of participation by the people of God without adopting notions borrowed from democracy and sociology which do not reflect the Catholic vision of the church and the authentic spirit of Vatican II? Uh, are you, am I, a living, contributing cell to my local parish? Or somebody said, Chris, you're just a wart on the mystical body of Christ. <laughs> I'm trying to shake that. Uh, and no, are, are we vibrant cells in our local, you obviously are, your local parishes and in the diocese as a whole? Another serious question, this is from the last the Constitution, another serious question is raised by the nature of relations between the church and the world. The Council's guidelines set forth in Gaudium et Spes and other documents of open, respectful, and cordial dialogue yet accompanied by careful discernment and courageous witness to the truth, remain a valid call and, and call us to greater commitment. Okay? Are you a part, am I a part, of the open, respectful, and cordial dialogue, say, about the uh, health and human services mandate? This, this is, this is uh, extremely relevant uh, for today. And lastly, uh, so th this, uh, this quote comes from so, uh, a letter that followed Pope Benedict's announcement of the year of faith says this, and it's directed to Catechus. It would be appropriate for each particular church, that's us, to review the reception of the Second Vatican Council and the Catechism of the Catholic Church in its own life and mission, particularly in the realm of catechesis. This would provide the opportunity for a renewal of commitment on the part of the catechetical offices of the dioceses, which have the duty to care for the theological formation of catechists. Okay, so catechists in a particular way have the, the, the duty to, to reflect upon the teachings and the purposes of the council and of the catechism itself. All right, so there it is, this sure compass. We looked at where the Second Vatican Council came from, why John XXIII found it necessary. We looked at the purposes, secondly, of the council and some of the things that it taught. And then thirdly, we kind of did a group uh, examination of conscience about how well each of us individually have received the